can see it. There we go. Can you can you see it? All right. Hi everyone. I'm Jeff Ravage, and she pretty much got uh, who I am and where I work. I'm also a adjunct uh, researcher for the Denver Botanic Gardens, and uh, I'm attached to the uh, Sam Mitchell Herbarium of Fungi. Although we're trying to change the name to the Fungarium of fungi because uh, that's becoming a more common uh, phrase since um, fungus are not herbs, they're not plants. So uh, we're gonna look at uh, the pre-publication uh, results of the fungal degradation of woody byproducts of forest management activities, uh, paper where I was the lead researcher and Lauren Zaplicki who is uh, principal of science by design in Boulder, uh, helped run all the analysis on us. And uh, we are going to just dive into uh, what we're doing. So Carol Icarius about uh, six years ago, actually, uh, tasked me with trying to come up with a way to deal with uh, huge amounts of wood chips that were left on the ground following uh, a lot of our forest management activities. In particular, I had been looking at um, a plot of uh, Ponderosa on the property of um, former governor, um, well, one of our former governors. Anyway, there's a lot of them that have ranches around here where they had hydroaxed uh, as the entire treatment and not removed any biomass at all left over 12 inches of wood chips on the floor of the forest. And after a decade, there was zero regen of grasses or anything on there. And so we started like looking at what, you know, what could possibly be done, you know, are there enzymes? And quickly we came to the conclusion that, that fungus, that wood rotting fungus might be able to uh, consume this. So uh, we started researching into, uh, what fungus uh, there were and how they might react to this type of woody material. And we came up, there are uh, three main types of forest fungi. There's saprophytes, which are the primary decayers uh, and the recyclers of the forest. There are parasites. The parasites live on plants. They live on animals. They even live on other fungi. There's a uh, gourmet mushroom called the lobster mushroom, which is actually a hypomyce that grows on top of a ruchula, which is a common kind of rusty red mushroom you'll see uh, in this uh, Western uh, montane environments. And then there's the mycorrhizas and the mycorrhizas are the mushrooms that live uh, as uh, in a mutualistic manner with our trees and our shrubs and to a lesser extent with our grasses and forbs. So we are, Mostly interested, our FOIs, the fungi of interest, are the saprotrophs and the detritivores. So saprotrophs uh, rot wood, and they basically rot bull wood. So dead trees, logs are eaten by these mushrooms. <laughs> um, can folks uh, please mute? Um, yep. You may not be muted. Thank you. Sorry, Jeff, I want to just help you there. That's okay. So here's one of our most common uh, saprophytic mushrooms, the oyster mushroom growing out of a, uh, of a snag. And then this over here is a coprinus. Coprinus lives in the detritus in the duff. It uh, breaks down uh, more complicated materials, but all of them uh, have a specific uh, array of uh, highly targeted enzymes and um, peroxides that they use to break down really tough material, in this case, uh, cellulose. So we have two main types of rotters, the white rot. The white rot eats lignin. So the characteristic of a white rot is this white cottony fiber, which is the cellulose fiber left behind after the lignin has been digested. Lignin is extremely carbon dense and uh, 
So it releases, I would say, probably more carbon dioxide into the environment than a, a brown rotter does. Brown rotters eat cellulose. They eat the fiber and leave the lid behind. And you can tell them by the characteristic cuboidal rot structure that you see here and that we all see hiking around in the woods. That's the sign of a brown rotter. So either one of these would be a primary choice uh, for trying to rot basically wood chips that were left behind uh, from a forest management pro process. So we went out and tried to find a place where we would have a good amount of uh, wood chips on the ground. And what we found was a Denver Mountain Park, uh, uh, Berrien Mountain, had done a uh, fuels reduction project approximately nine months, nine months before we began our experiment. So we had fresh chips on the ground. It was a remote site, so they couldn't really haul any of the logs out. So 100% of the material that was harvested was deposited on the ground. And we did have drifts up to three feet deep and a general covering of around 12 inches of uh, wood chips all over the entire mountainside. So it, it was perfect. It was not many people were going to go up there to molest it. Nobody was going to figure out where it was. And we had wood chips galore to work with. So what we did is we created two plots like this. Each plot has five one meter squares. And we excavated the whole site, flattened the ground underneath it, put the wood chips back into a standard depth of 12 inches, and then inoculated each with a eight to 10 pound block of spawn of um, basically mycelia that had overrun wood chips. And we'll go into later how we train our wood chips and create these. So our methods were really simple. You're looking here at mostly the tools we use. We used a compost thermometer with a deep probe and uh, uh, measuring tape, and then little labels for uh, telling us which um, plot we were looking at. So we would go in and we could use our depth probe to move through the, uh, through the wood chips, and you could hear when you hit ground, and it, you know, it changes the um, resistance to your probe. So we would take the probe, the depth of the ground, bring it out, measure that depth, and then put the thermometer back in at half that depth and let it sit for a couple of minutes so that we could get a temperature at the center of the mass that uh, we were monitoring. Each plot would be monitored uh, four times. There would be four measurements taken on each plot on each visit. We visited uh, once a month during the growing season more or less for five years. Um, we didn't have a great amount of funding and then there was fires and if we had to go at that time, uh, I was on a volunteer fire department. If I had to go on a fire, I had to go on a fire. And so there are a couple of months that are missing but pretty much we have fairly continuous uh, monitoring for 60 months. We created a, a application in Fulcrum and Fulcrum is like a master application that you can build data collecting applications so that we would have uh, the ability to just dump out a database with all of our data because in the end we had thousands of data points on depths and temperatures and, uh, and plots. So we would go in basically, we have five plots on each site. One is inoculated, one is um, control. And then we would use a random number sheet to tell us which plots we were measuring and off of each control or inoculated, we do two on each uh, monitoring. So uh, uh, four plots would be measured with four uh, sets of, of measurements. So that would be 16 measurements per um, visit. If we saw mushrooms, we would, we would photograph them and we would try and figure out uh, which species they were. In the first couple of years, they were pretty much always the mushrooms we put in there. And in the third to final years, we would see succession of other mushrooms that would come in afterwards. 
So here we have it. We have our hero was Pleurotus pulmonarius. It's that oyster mushroom. Here it is growing out of the wood chips in Berrien Mountain. You can see that its morphology has changed slightly. It's no longer coming out like a shelf, like a bract, but it does have a fully developed stipe or a stem coming out of the ground. And we'd seen that in the lab with several other of these conch type mushrooms when we grew them uh, on a horizontal surface in wood chips, specifically uh, a gilled polypore called Gliophilum sepiarium and uh, a uh, velvet footed polypore, which is uh, Onia tomentosa, which we'll see a little bit later. And we have good news about Onia. It's doing some great work with us. It's a detritivore. So um, it has a wider palette of materials it will digest. So here's our results at the end of five years. And that's six growing seasons over those five years. Our bed depth for both started out as 12. An interesting thing that happened is at the end of the second year, our inoculated beds were deeper when the mycelia really overtook uh, a bed, the bed swelled. Part of this might be physical action of the mushroom body itself, but a lot of it would be the moisture. The mushrooms themselves um, are, uh, you know, 70% water. And uh, well, the, the mycelia are, the actual mushroom fruiting bodies are 80 plus percent water. So, that probably accounts for the swelling and then the swelling begins going down. But immediately at season three, we see the difference in the compaction of the bed as it goes down to uh, from 12 inches to around four inches at the end of our measuring, whereas the non-inoculated control piles uh, were able to compact down to about eight inches, which we pretty much figure is mostly just physical compaction and the action of being tread upon because all of these sites, uh, when you saw that picture of it, you saw that we had a, a caution tape around it. That caution tape didn't last very long. And there was a lot of herbivory going on, lots of squirrels and uh, even deer will occasionally, especially in our inoculated beds, dig around and munch on the mushrooms. So we collected as many mushrooms as we could and, um, but we always figured because of only going up, you know, once a month or, or slightly less that we missed a lot of the fruiting activities, but our main focus was not how many mushrooms could we grow. Our main focus was how much rot could we induce. So as we went along, we discovered that there were different uh, stages of decomposition. Now it's well known, you know, in forestry that if you look at like a downed log, there's like five stages of decomposition that we normally use. But since these aren't logs and the, you know, loss of limbs and deformation and sponginess weren't as applicable, we came up with our own method of uh, looking at it. And we came up with three stages. Stage one is a raw wood chip, as you can see on top of this. Stage two, is wood chips involved with mycelia. And you can see it's underneath it. Mycelia are involving it. It's already starting to break down uh, in the smaller bits as the mushrooms digest it. And then finally, there's stage three, which is compost. And it's pretty much, uh, I mean, this looks like dung and that's kind of the composition it has. It's like a uh, cow pie and you just break it apart and uh, it's extremely friable that it breaks down into dust. So here's our chip composition ratios. Stage, stage one always sits on the top. The top layer of these uh, piles never had enough moisture for uh, the mycelium to penetrate. So there would always be a noticeable moisture horizon and um, only below the moisture horizon would you find living mycelia. Um, so here we go through 
pieces one, two, and three, um, and then control stage five. But what I did to make it a little easier, I find it's easier to understand, to actually flip this upside down and backwards so that you're looking at a cross section now of a pile. Here's the top, the stage one. Here is this, the center, stage two, where uh, the mycelium is involved in the wood chips. And then stage three is compost. So as we go through the seasons, we can see that it becomes more and more predominantly stage three. The reason you see that stage one looks like it's more, even though it's actually the same, it's always the same one inch layer, more or less on top, but the pile is getting shallower. So one inch is a larger uh, proportion to the four inch final depth. Whereas we look over here at control, we see that we still have our one inch at the top and we have stage two after five years, the nature is doing the same thing we're doing. We're just trying to do it a little bit faster. And there is no stage three that we could determine uh, after five years in the control piles. And this pile in the control is eight inches deep, whereas the pile in the, uh, in the inoculated is four inches deep. So uh, this, this just kind of gives you a visual cross-section idea of what's going on as this decay is occurring within the pile. So we did a test of friability, and friability is just how easy is it to break down. Obviously, wood chips are very reluctant to break down when you just run them through a screen. So our main uh, technique was to take a one liter volumetric sample and then throw it into our kids' uh, Easter basket here to weigh it, and then run it through a one quarter inch screen for two minutes, and then weigh the amount that passes and the amount that is retained. So on day one, our viability um, test shows that um, really 20, I think it was about 22% passes, 78% is retained, which you would expect, it's a wood chip. On our day final control, it's very similar. We only have like 30, actually it's just a little under 30% passed and most of it is more than 70% is retained. But on our test, our inoculated beds, over 70% passed and less than 20% is retained. So it's almost an inverse of uh, what happens in control. So we're, we are, we're definitely accelerating the decay that's occurring uh, within these beds out in the wild. Now, we wanna look at what is our byproduct? What is that artificial uh, cow pie? What is our, conif our compost? So we ran a lab test on our materials and raw wood chips uh, have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 169 to one which one would expect, it's carbon dense, not a whole lot of uh, nitrogen in raw wood. Our compost is 39.5 to one. And then we compared it to the, oh, the A horizon uh, in a conifer forest. And we got that from Buck and St. Clair in 2012. And so the, the conifer duff is 35.5. So we, uh, have a little bit more carbon to our nitrogen in ratio, and we'll see that again. pH is neutral, which is really interesting. Raw wood chips and actual duff is slightly acidic, and uh, our, for some reason, our mushroom compost is darn near neutral in pH. The nitrogen, the phosphorus, and potassium are all pretty much the same. So it doesn't really change from wood chips to uh, compost, no matter whether nature makes it or we make it with our mushrooms. But the interesting thing about the organic matter is that we have two thirds more uh, carbon in our compost 
than there is in the, uh, the natural duff. And this has a lot to do, we go back to the white rot or brown rot. It depends upon what type of mushroom you're using. In our case, the um, pleurotus, the oyster, is a white rotter. So it's been digesting the, um, it's been digesting the lignin and leaving behind um, the cellulose. So it's uh, probably because it undergoes the decay faster, we're seeing a higher uh, carbon content. And one would probably expect that maybe over a decade or so, they would even out. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop uh, some brown rotters and, and most of the uh, most of your gourmet edible mushrooms that you look for are wood rotters and most of them are white rotters. We don't want to use any mushrooms that could be toxic. We prefer to use mushrooms that are edible. Uh, that way, uh, if a human comes across it, there's no uh, liability and no problem. But we also don't have a problem with using a mushroom that's non-toxic and tastes bad. But we're still, we've done this, you know, for five years. We're still really in the beginning of understanding what's going on. And our, our hope is that once we get this published, we'll be able to get more funding and, and look uh, more deeply into what's going on. Now, something that we did not foresee when we started, but we saw at the end, is the production of topsoil an actual organic uh, mineral intermix. So this is one of the sites and I apologize, I did not, one, we discovered this on you know our last monitoring trip and two, I have never had any training in how to photograph dirt and it's a lot more difficult than you would think. But we'll go in here and get a close up of that so that we can actually see here that we have you know brown topsoil and we can actually see the um, the broken down wood chips infiltrating into it. And since, you know, this, this whole pile is filled with, you know, isopods and springtails and annelids and all sorts of things, all churning everything up. Um, that's how all this intermixing is, uh, is occurring. So when we go out and try and do another test in the wild like this, we're, we're going to try and set it up to see if we can capture more information about what's really going on with this topsoil. And also, this site and Berrien Mountain, we, we left it marked because we're not going to be going back every month, but we're going back every year. And, and we hope to do this for maybe 20 years to see what happens to this. Does this disappear too? Does the other mountainside of wood chips become this as well after 20 years? Do they catch up at some point? Um, those are things we don't know, but all interesting questions that we want to ask. Site two was our first replication, and this was done uh, on season two of our five-year study. Uh, a couple of doctors that lived up in Evergreen heard about us through uh, Jefferson Conservation District, who had overseen a logging project on their property. They'd gone to uh, Europe for a couple of months when their logging was going on and the logger had said, hey, do you want me to leave you some wood chips? Uh, you know, you could use it for mulch or stuff. And they were like, sure, we'd love some mulch. And they came back and found a pile that was 90 feet wide, 90 feet long, 50 feet wide and four feet deep. And uh, quite a, a, a large uh, pile to deal with. So they were willing to pay us to produce the spawn to put in here. I guess I should have been looking at my notes. Um, one thing that's important to think about is what was the rate of seeding? When we did the original test on the one meter plots, uh, putting one block of mycelium in the center of it, that was a rate of seed, seeding of 37.5 to one. This, because of the huge size of the pile and because of our funding, was inoculated 100. And strangely enough, and we don't know why, <coughs> excuse me, decay occurred much more rapidly in this pile. Within two seasons, so about a year and a half on the calendar, uh, but 
two, you know, summer seasons had seen probably 60 to 70% decay within three seasons, which would be one season before we finished our five year study on Bergen Mountain, it was almost completely broken down. And all you had was the top one inch layer of wood chips and underneath it, it just all broke down into dust. Now there was a huge amount of herbivity that went on here because of the large site. We recorded a, a fair amount of mushrooms coming out, but every time we'd go up there, there would be holes dug. Uh, you could tell that it was mostly, well, we, we knew from the homeowners that it was most elk because this is elk territory outside of Evergreen. The deer don't come in there. Also, we think there was some bear because huge holes and then bears tend to leave the, these nice little calling cards behind when they've eaten to let you know that they were there. So um, we think that, you know, part of it might be uh, the moisture of the site. We had, uh, we monitored the moisture uh, Kohoras, which is a, a community uh, citizen science uh, weather monitoring uh, website, built us a page to monitor uh, moisture on our Berrien Mountain site. We did not have such a page for this site, but could have been more moisture, definitely more mechanical kneading of this pile because of the herbivity, because everybody's digging through it to chow down on these mushrooms continually. But anyway, that could be a benefit depending upon your site, how wild it is, if you were to use this type of technique uh, to uh, deal with your slash on a project where hauling it out is just uh, not feasible. And to that end, we knew that we would have to see whether or not this would work on an industrial scale. Because if this doesn't work in large piles and doesn't work theoretically on 100 acre uh, treatments, then it's, uh, it's a nice novelty. But we need, to, we need to scale it up and see if it would work on a larger scale. So that came to, uh, we started in 2018, you can see here, trying to figure out how to do this. In 2020, we actually did create this pile. Uh, the pile was designed to use wood chips from the Chatfield Reallocation Project, the Chatfield Reservoir, where they had to log uh, clear cut 300 acres of cottonwood in order to raise the level of the reservoir by about 12 to 15 feet, I believe. And we wanted to use their wood chips because it was a five mile haul to the Denver Botanic Gardens uh, Chatfield Farms. And we were able to obtain permission uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers that actually owns the land that the Denver Botanic Garden is on in order to build this huge pile. Which you can see uh, only part of it, and it's uh, built to the specifications of our drawing. And so its uh, rate of seed was 20 to one. You can see here the volunteers are going this, uh, what you saw in the first photograph was the far end of the pile where we were looking at um, post, uh, post and pole mills waste products from making uh, post and dolphin, uh, pine and also doing some work with ponderosa. So mostly lodgepole chips with some ponderosa. And then this is uh, shredded cottonwood. So on this end and the uh, flags mark where we put in a bag of spawn and so we inoculated that in 2020, and it is in the process of rotting as we speak. This is basically the spawn run that we did for uh, Denver Botanic Gardens, Chatfield Farms. We received funding from the Chatfield Reallocation uh, Project uh, to try this out, which as you can see, there's a lot of work involved in creating this many bags of spawn. We worked at the uh, Mile High Fungi uh, facility, which is a gourmet mushroom lab in Conifer. So we're able to do this many bags of mushrooms in about a six hour day. So uh, it was really helpful. And you can see over here, when we inoculate it, we have to 
protect the spawn from ultraviolet light uh, because it's not, it's, you know, it's in the open in a clear plastic bag until it gets buried it is susceptible to sunburn, which I don't think would be fatal, but would probably reduce the speed at which uh, it overtook the pile. We also, with the US Forest Service, uh, took another equal number of bags and threw them into this shredded material uh, that's at the Crags Campground at the base of Pikes Peak outside of Divide, Colorado. This is uh, leftovers from a fuels treatment that was done a couple of years prior. And they made one massive machine pile right in an SMZ, a stream management zone. So they were able to get the contractor to come back and break it into smaller piles there was, and uh, move it back away from the stream a little bit. Hopefully they were hoping they could burn it, but because it was so moist, uh, uh, wicked up water from the ground. So we we're like, well, if it's gonna be moist shredded material, there's, there's a lot of room in this roof of material for possible contamination. So we really didn't know, and we still don't, although monitoring has shown us mushrooms are growing in this pile, but I don't know what the efficacy is going to be. But the fact that this pile maintains a moisture content of 50% uh, pretty much all the time. It gives us hope that maybe we can use it for remediation of a, a minor environmental boo-boo such as this one. So, so here's how we do it. We go out and we collect native mushrooms, bring them in the lab and we clone them. We basically slice, we try and get material from the base of the stem or the top of the cap and run it on, uh, this is a MEA, no, this is, uh, I'm sorry, PDY, potato dextrose yeast agar. Uh, it's basically just a, a fungal candy bar. It's uh, carbohydrates and sugars held in uh, gel form. We then go through, once we get them growing, we expand them onto the material we want them to grow. So all of these jars, our materials collected from uh, the sites. You can see this; these jars have mycelium in it. These jars are getting inoculated. This is the beginning of the training amplification process. So you keep putting them into higher quality, higher uh, percentages of the type of wood chip you want them to eat. You always give them a little carbohydrates, which in, generally is uh, rye grain, could be wheat grain. Um, you reduce the, the grain on each successive generation and increase the amount of the wood chips of the materials, the specific material you want them to eat. Because we're actually taking, um, say, for example, in the first uh, experiment, we took oysters who are endemic on cottonwood, but they're, they're pretty broad spectrum, but we had to train them to uh, accept wood chips that were conifers, and it was rel it was easy to do. I mean, oysters, mushrooms will eat anything. Uh, I had a, a really great photograph of an oyster mushroom that somebody found a, was cleaning out a basement in Denver from an abandoned house, and there was a, a baby chair that was made out of particle board, and it had a huge oyster mushroom growing on it because of the dampness down there, and the particle board, it didn't care whether there was uh, adhesives or whatever the glue was involved in creating the, the particle board, it munched it all. And that's why we love oyster mushrooms. They tend to eat everything. So as part of the chain of custody also, we want to make sure before we put our mushrooms back uh, into the ground that we know what we're putting in the ground. So we fruit all of our strains once we get them to maturity in order to prove that they are the mushrooms that we say they are. And those mushrooms are the oyster. Here's a proof of a Pleurotus ostriatus, which we used in uh, the Denver Botanic Gardens and also on um, crags. Our original Pleurotus pulmonarius did not survive, keeping 
strains running is a uh, time and ex cost uh, costly, somewhat costly endeavor. We've kind of got it down and we have a refrigerator and a freezer with nothing but uh, living mushroom strains in them now in order to try and make sure that once we get strains going, we can keep uh, going so that we don't have to start from zero every time that we're doing this. Another one that we use that's uh, quite popular is the turkey tail, the Tremites Versicolor. It's a conch mushroom and it's uh, not considered edible because it tastes like wood, but it is non-toxic and it's considered uh, a medicinal. And I have no comment on that, on whether it is or not, but it does rot wood. Here's Onia tomentosa, which is one I was telling you about. That's a conch that's capable of forming a stem. This one has a nice little stem underneath it. And it is a tritivore. And right now I am uh, I have it in a fruiting chamber, seeing if we could fruit it, but it has over the last winter trained very well on using post-consumer slash site uh, ground slash. So that's that's you know slice that has its branches, so it's it's wood, it's bark, it's a high component of needles, so it's high uh, in nitrogen. And our wood rotters never really liked that material, but the Onia seems to uh, enjoy it. So we'll see whether or not we can get it going at one of our uh, slice sites and try and eat some post-consumer slash. We also have an interesting foliota. So we came up with this idea to use the Sam Mitchell herbarium in Denver uh, to, as a bank for uh, the genes because we have thousands of specimens collected in Colorado of different mushrooms. They're identified by experts, so we know what they are. So we went there and collected a bunch of spores and then uh, grew them on uh, petri dishes. And this was a, uh, I believe this was a chicken of the woods, um, was the mushroom it came from, but it's definitely a oleoda, a scaly cap, and it eats wood like it's going out of style and it fruits nicely. Um, we think it's a, uh, uh, it's not a, the most common one in Colorado, which is Foliota squarosa, but uh, there's another Foliota. We're trying to figure out what it is. And the Sam Mitchell herbarium just moved into a new laboratory. So uh, we lost it. Well, we didn't lose a year. There was a year where we had, had interesting things occurring that we couldn't take into a lab and have an expert run a DNA analysis on it, but we will eventually be running a DNA analysis and be able to give this mushroom a name. And then Conopus acervatus, which is a, uh, it grows very similar to uh, the beach mushrooms that you buy uh, at the uh, Asian market or at the health food store. They're not particularly uh, yummy. They're, they are edible, but they pretty much taste like the wood that they grew on. So uh, there is no common name. Uh, and commonly, I would think that most, uh, you know, amateur mushroom hunters would assume that these were what they call LBMs, a little brown mushroom. Little brown mushrooms nobody eats because too many of them are potentially poisonous and they're difficult to tell apart. But we were able to, before the move, We've had this strain running for five years, so we've been able to run the DNA. So we know that this is Conopus acervatus. And so we've been using it to rot some wood. So what's next? If we continue and get funding and looking into this, something that I'm extremely interested in is the potential to go to an extreme burn site, chip the wood, inoculate it with uh, mushrooms and and skip about 20 years of uh, natural processes and immediately begin creating duff that's not just uh, you know not just compost not just a nutrient source on the ground but it's completely full of all sorts of fungi and insects and bugs because everything is going to be attracted to it and uh, I think there there is a potential 
for post-fire restoration to use this technique to kickstart uh, the plant life cycle in these areas. So we're gonna give credit to where credit is due. We, we've had over a hundred volunteers working at different stages uh, along this project. There was a lot of manual labor involved in creating piles like this and in uh, inoculating them with uh, mushrooms and even filling the bags with wood chips before we go into the lab and hydrate them and inoculate them. And then of course, there are our partners who have either supplied us with funding or supplied us with expertise or um, places to run our experiment. So uh, thank you to the Denver Botanic Gardens, Denver Water, the US Forest Service, Chatfield Reallegation Project, and Denver Mountain Parks. And with that, we've reached the end and we can open it up for questions. And I'm going to stop the share and go back to everyone. Hi, everyone. It's great, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. I know I have a couple, but let's see uh, what are the questions you all have for Jeff. Eli, start with one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll pick a really good one. Um, are any of these species commercially viable and can be used with local restaurant groups to offset the cost of inoculation if it's done at scale? The answer is yes. Most of those species have a commercial uh, use, like the turkey tail is probably more valuable uh, in a health food store as a, an herbal remedy than the oysters are in a restaurant as something to put spectacular to put on top of a steak. Um, like I said, we don't have great data on how, I mean, we collected all the fruit that we found, but we don't have great data on how much fruit was actually produced in this process because it was being done where it's being grazed upon. And even at the Denver Botanic Garden site, as we've gone and um, done monitoring there, it's, it's being eaten by deer and whatever is around there, wild turkeys, whatever is wandering in the area. Uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, in the fall, like Abert squirrel will convert its diet and it'll eat like 70% fungus. And this, you know, since the, Micro, and those are mycorrhizals, those aren't our type of fungus, but when we originally uh, put in our site at Berrien Mountain, we were underneath Ponderosa, and the first year when we went up to do our year-end uh, monitoring, the Abert squirrels were not happy with us messing around with their mushrooms, and they were throwing pine cones at us, like, leave our mushrooms alone. <laughs> So the answer is yes, but we don't know how much, so. Jeff, um, I was, first of all, I found this extremely interesting. So thank you so much for this presentation. And um, I, in your mind, what is, what is the main application of this? Would this be for harvests that are done you know, say on steep slopes and areas that you can't really haul uh, either the wood out or chips out easily. Is that, what, you know, I did also see that you were looking, you know, at post fire, which I found also very interesting. Um, but, you know, initially, like what would, what do you see as the main application and maybe, you know, in the long term as well um, for this kind of process? I actually see three. So obviously the first application was, what, how do we deal with the excess amount of wood that we create when we're uh, in a remote site? And, and even if we're not on an extremely remote site, the amount of uh, carbon that's put in the atmosphere hauling off 
waste products that we have no good use for uh, when we're doing uh, forestry treatments it is huge. So if we could reduce the uh, carbon footprint and the whole idea was to create a, uh, uh, you know, a, a sub treatment that was, you apply it once and you basically walk away and let nature take its course because really what we're doing is using the mechanisms of nature. So that's the first one in, uh, in treatments, uh, either remote or uh, just to reduce your carbon footprint while you're doing it. The second one is post fire where there's no uh, nitrogen left in the ground. There's no spores, there's no seed base. And uh, this you know, potentially would give us if, if you know, you put them in and then wait five years and then go in and try and put in your seedlings, this could probably uh, increase the viability of the seedlings that survive and uh, also allow a lot of volunteers because a lot of the seeds for grasses and forbs can travel miles and miles on the wind or on in the fur of a, of a deer walking by. All it needs to do is find a seed bed. And then the third use would be at mills where you have waste products and your byproduct is an agricultural product. It's compost that can be used to uh, fortify uh, soils. And the, one of the things that we didn't talk about in the uh, in this presentation because it's only one sentence in the whole study, and that is when we took the temperature readings, we saw that the temperature was never more than one degree warmer than the ambient soil temperature. The composting that is under that is done by uh, fungus does not create heat. It will never create a pile that can spontaneously combust. Spontaneous combustion is a big problem in wood piles where you have bacterial uh, composting going on. So it allows us a, a method of composting that's less labor intensive, even though it'll take longer. You know, if it takes two years as opposed to uh, like A1 Organics here in Denver that I've gone and looked at their composting where they mix the green with the brown and then they have to turn it to make sure the pile doesn't go anaerobic. Uh, very labor intensive, but they can produce compost in a year. Uh, so ours is slower, but it's in some way safer and, and potentially cheaper because it's just throw it in and let it eat it. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, first of all, a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, is this something you could see working on like dry ponderosa forests of Arizona, for example, or is it better suited for like mountainous areas of Colorado where it might get more moisture? <laughs> it's pretty dry here. The average precipitation, well, the average precipitation on this site was I think 16 inches a year. So that's probably more than you guys get. Um, yeah. We, we ran into down right after we did the uh, inoculation of the Denver Botanic Gardens, we had one of the driest summers we had where we only had nine tenths of an inch of precipitation all summer long. And because of that, we didn't have a whole lot of fungal growth, but it didn't appear to kill it either. It, it seemed to be able to, you know, sort of um, what, what we see, uh, you know, we talk about this, you know, with my colleagues, is we see a, a form called a sclerotia. And a sclerotia is like a hibernating form. And that's how the mushrooms overwinter in this type of material and, and in detritus. And uh, we, we, we saw those. It, it's not really relevant to how much it rots. It's only an interesting thing to note. And also we wanted to, we wanted to know, would, this, would these mushrooms overwinter? And they did, they overwintered for at least three winters before they were overtaken by native volunteers of different, uh, different types of detritivore mushrooms. The, the most common of which is the honey mushroom, um, which we would never put in a pile because the honey mushroom is mildly toxic.
but if nature put it there, we basically say it's not our, it's, we didn't do it. It's the Bart Simpson defense. Thanks. Yeah. I was going to ask about the temperatures. So that's that's great. Um, I'm curious. It was, those were some pretty deep beds of chips, even up there to leave a 12 inch bed out in the middle of the woods. Um, but once it was getting down to four or five inches there toward the end, did you start seeing any other herbaceous vegetation start to come into those at all? We actually monitored and counted uh, seedlings that occurred on the plots every year because every year there were hundreds of seedlings that would pop up, but none of them survived. And, and we did not see anything. Uh, I would say that still at four inches, you're still kind of, uh, you know, smothering out the understory. Uh, which is why we're looking towards the concept of the windrow, you know, rather than trying to just spread it out everywhere, you know, a couple of feet deep, make a windrow that follows the contour of the ground and maybe, you know, use it to cover your skid trails with. And uh, so you can reclaim your skid trails at the same time and you have more depth, less footprint, and then, you know, gravity will, and, and your, you know, your herbivores will spread it for you. Because hopefully, you know, once we really know what we're doing and know what the correct rate of seeding is and the best species to use on this type of wood, it will be, uh, we'll just go in and we'll do it. And 10 years from now, you hopefully won't know that we did anything. It'll just look like a forest floor. We probably have time if anybody has one more burning question. I do, if nobody else does. Oh, go for it. One thing I want to ask you, Jeff, are there any issues with like beetles or, you know, with these big, huge pile, piles out in the forest? Um, would that, you know, counter your, you know, if you have uh, beetles or something that infests these piles, would that be something um, that would prevent you from really doing this across the forest. <clears throat> Excuse me. Are you talking about beetles that are a problem? Yeah, just uh, any like kind of pathogenic. Insect. Yeah, pathogenic. Uh, 